Namaskara and welcome to BIC Talks, a podcast by Bangalore International Centre, bringing you conversations that move, inform and encourage discourse. I wrote this book to find out what makes um, people tick who, who retain their moral commitment for the long term. But in the course of writing it, I discovered something I didn't expect, which was that many people believe it's possible to be too moral, too committed. And this, this, one of the best expressions of this uh, feeling uh, was George Orwell in an essay he wrote on Gandhi. And I quote, the essence of being human is that one does not seek perfection, that one is sometimes willing to commit sins for the sake of loyalty, that one does not push asceticism to the point where it makes friendly intercourse impossible and that one is prepared in the end to be defeated and broken up by life, which is the inevitable price of fastening one's love upon other human individuals. It is too readily assumed that the ordinary man only rejects sainthood because it is too difficult, but it is doubtful whether this is is true. Many people genuinely do not wish to be saints, and it is probable that some who achieve or aspire to sainthood have never felt much temptation to be human beings. What does it mean to devote yourself wholly to helping others? In her book, Strangers Drowning, Larissa McFarqua seeks out people living lives of extreme ethical commitment and tells their deeply intimate stories, their stubborn integrity and their compromises, their bravery and their recklessness, their joys and defeats and wrenching dilemmas. In this provocative conversation, Writer Saman Subramanian, along with Larissa, contemplates what it means to be human. In a world of strangers drowning in need, how much should we help and how much can we help? Is it right to care for strangers even at the expense of those we are closest to? What exactly do we value as human beings and why? This conversation was originally streamed as part of the Bangalore Life Science Cluster and NCBS Archives public lecture series and has been adapted to this podcast. And now, over to Samant and Larissa. So, yeah, this talk is based on a book, Strangers Drowning, which I wrote about people who are gripped by a sense of moral urgency, the kind of people who believe that living even a decent life requires a lot from them. As an example, I met a nurse who uh, worked for 25 years in a Nicaraguan village where no other nurse would go because it was a war zone and too dangerous. I met a woman who gave one of her kidneys to a stranger, and I met a couple who adopted 20 special needs children. And the reason I set out to meet these people is because the question I began with was, why don't most of us, and this very much includes myself, give more than we do to others? And... This is not a fake rhetorical question. I genuinely believe that it's strange that we don't, because as we know, all of us know, giving is pleasurable. Giving something away often makes you happier than keeping it. So I think it's a real question why we don't give more. And if you ask people, the usual answer is, oh, of course, we're human, we're weak-willed, we're selfish, we're lazy, we like our stuff too much to give it up. And all of that's true. But I don't believe that's the whole story. Another reason is that the need of the world seems infinite. And so to, even to open your mind to it can be overwhelming. And we might worry that it's hopeless to try to do anything about it or to do anything serious would involve a frightening amount of sacrifice. So I wanted to know from these people, what does it take to live an ambitiously good life? What sort of person can confront these difficulties and take them on, not just for a year or two years, but for the long term, for their whole life. And then there's the question, what is a good life? We can all agree that most people could do more than they do. But the harder question, at least for the kind of person I was meeting, was how much should we do? The question is, is it good to live as moral a life as possible? To bind yourself to a severe morality that constricts spontaneity and freedom, And is it possible for a person to hold himself to unforgiving standards without becoming unforgiving? And the other question is, if you're deeply committed to helping strangers, you will not be able to give everything you want to your family. And then 
you have to ask, is it right to give to strangers at the expense of the people you love? So those are the questions I started the book with. And I'm going to do some talking and some reading. I want to read um, a passage to give you a sense of what I mean. Okay, page 41. When Aaron Pitkin was a young man, he searched for a cause to devote his life to, some way to lessen the suffering that he saw in the world. And the answer he came up with was chickens. It was basically a numbers game. More than 8 billion chickens were killed each year in America, close to a million an hour. The vast majority of animals killed for food were chickens because they were so small. The meat to life ratio was terrible. And what factory farms did to chickens before they died appalled him. The birds in chronic pain, most of the six weeks or so that they were alive, so fat that their legs couldn't hold their bodies up, sitting in their own feces, covered in sores. Aaron realized that if he could figure out a way to make chickens' lives better, then the quantity of suffering he could eliminate would be many times greater than in any other way he could think of. It wasn't that he thought chickens were more important than people or more innocent or more moving. He cared about them because they were more helpless and more brutally trodden on than even the most oppressed people. Their suffering was greater and their situation more unjust. He didn't spend time pondering how happy a chicken in better circumstances could really be. He wasn't interested in happiness. He was interested in pain. Although he made animal suffering his life's work, it didn't affect him much emotionally. When he heard about some new terrible abuse or even when he saw horrifying footage, half the time his immediate reaction was, fantastic, this will be great for the cause. This dispassion did not affect how hard he worked or the lengths he was willing to go to, however. After Hurricane Katrina, he drove hundreds of mi miles from Boston to New Orleans in his car to save chickens because he knew the factories would be flooded and nobody else would care enough to try. Aaron is in his 40s. He works at a large animal rights organization and has been an extraordinarily effective chicken advocate, helping to bring about a dramatic change in both laws and attitudes. He is a vegan because he believes it's the right thing to do, but he's not a purist about it. He's a pragmatist who believes that relieving suffering is more important than adhering to principle. For this reason, he thinks he should probably eat meat when he is meeting with cattlemen, he also works on cows, in order to prove that he is not some marginal zealot out to destroy them, but a regular Joe whom they can deal with. The trouble is if anyone from the movement saw him eating meat, his authority would be irreversibly destroyed. He thinks about the example of a famous animal rights person who he'd heard was an awful person with a coke habit given to sexual harassment and waving guns about. But the, things that, the thing that really scandalized his followers was the rumor that he'd been spotted eating M&Ms. True, the people who raised hell about the M&Ms were a bit crazy, but they were Aaron's base. He needed them to do his work. Aaron decided in high school that it was wrong to eat meat and he ought to be a vegetarian, but it took him six months to become one. Every day he would get off the bus and go to Hardee's and eat a bacon cheeseburger and feel terrible about it. Sometime later, he visited a place called Farm Sanctuary, an organization that rescued animals from agribusiness. And he discovered that animals were harmed in the production of eggs and dairy too. So he decided that the only defensible position was to be a vegan. He thought, boy, I am going to miss ice cream, but I have no choice. In college, he decided to dedicate his life to social justice. His initial plan was to work as a doctor in the third world. And then he read an essay that changed his life, the philosopher Peter Singer's article, Famine, Affluence, and Morality. Singer argued that it was impossible to justify buying luxuries when a few hundred dollars donated to an international aid agency could save a person's life. After Aaron read Singer's article, everything he bought, even the smallest, cheapest thing, felt to him like food or medicine snatched from someone dying. Nobody would buy a soda if there were a starving child standing next to the vending, ma vending machine, he thought. Well, for him now, there was always a starving child standing next to the vending machine. He became very, very frugal. He went dumpster diving for food. Every time he spent money, no matter how little, he would write the amount in a notebook. When he was in his mid-20s, Aaron met Jen. She was working at the New England Anti-Vivisection Society when Aaron walked in and offered his services as an expert on mad cow disease. Aaron and Jen moved in together and then the trouble started. For one thing, Aaron was messy, not just untidy, dirty. Laundry would pile up in his room, 
dishes in the sink. Aaron would make huge batches of food to save money, pounds and pounds of lentil stew or hummus, and leave crusted pans and bowls all over the kitchen. When Jen complained, he told her that time spent washing dishes could be time spent working for animal rights, which were more important. She couldn't think of a good counter argument to that. In fact, she thought he was right from a moral point of view. So all she could say when she felt herself going crazy, pressed to the brink by the filth in the kitchen was, but I need it, I want it, I am asking you. Years later, she would wish she'd thought to yell at him, you know what, it's all about balance and we live in an imperfect world and you're right, doing those dishes will take away from the animals, do the effing dishes before I have a nervous breakdown. But back then she was young and she wasn't sure what was right or normal or what she deserved. What killed her too is that she had always thought of herself as an extremely ethical person. And now she felt like the selfish one, the bourgeois one. Dishes? When animals were being tortured and people were starving? Dishes? Jen came from a terrible family. Her mother had been raised in an orphanage and got pregnant when she was very young. Her father had owned a garage and made quite a bit of money, but then he became a violent alcoholic and lost it all. As a child, she was molested by her father and by her two brothers. When she told her mother about the abuse and that she was thinking about suicide, her mother told her she understood and if Jen wanted to kill herself, she should go ahead. All through school, Jen worked for money to help her mother with the rent. And during college, she sometimes recycled cans to earn money for food. She started racking up credit card debt, but she believed in the women's movement. And so when she graduated, instead of trying to get a high paying job, she went to work for a battered women's group for practically nothing. Still with her history, Jen felt that if she wanted to make herself feel better by buying a pair of shoes occasionally, that was okay. She was careful with money, but Aaron was so much more so that he made her feel guilty. Jen worked hard, but Aaron was always working and work always came first. He felt that there was so much suffering in the world. He felt the weight of it almost physically. How could he stop? How could he relax and watch TV with his girlfriend when people were starving? Sometimes she thought he was right to do that, but sometimes she thought that she, as his girlfriend, des deserved special treatment, that people owed more to those they were close to than to strangers. Sometimes they would, they would discuss this issue philosophically. Suppose there were two people drowning over there, Jen would ask, and I was drowning over here, and you could save either the two people or me, what would you do? These discussions always ended badly. His activism, she realized, was the other woman in their relationship and one with which she could never compete. The only time he was fully there for her was when she was in a crisis so awful that he felt it justified diverting his attention. When her father died, she was scared to go to the funeral because her brothers would be there. But Aaron took care of her. The day of the funeral, he helped her get dressed because she was so numb she could barely move. He put aside his dislike of religion to say Kaddish with her because she didn't want to pray alone. So I've told a lot of people about Aaron Pitkin and I have yet to find someone who sides with him rather than Jen, even though Jen herself believed that he was right. And of course, this is not about just the refusal to wash dishes, though that is bad enough. In the course of writing this book, as I told you at the beginning, I, I, wrote, the, I wrote this book to find out what makes um, people tick who, who retain their moral commitment for the long term. But in the course of writing it, I discovered something I didn't expect, which was that many people believe it's possible to be too moral, too committed. And this, this one of the best expressions of this uh, feeling uh, was George Orwell in an essay he wrote on Gandhi. And I quote, the essence of being human is that one does not seek perfection, that one is sometimes willing to commit sins for the sake of loyalty, that one does not push asceticism to the point where it makes friendly intercourse impossible, and that one is prepared in the end to be defeated and broken up by life, which is the inevitable price of fastening one's love upon other human individuals. It is too readily assumed that the ordinary man only rejects sainthood because it is too difficult, but it is doubtful whether this is, whether this is true. Many people genuinely do not wish to be saints, and it is probable that some who achieve or aspire to sainthood have never felt much temptation to be human beings." End quote. So I knew, I, and I knew when I set out to write the book that people would disagree about the right thing to do, but this I did not expect, that, that many people don't admire moral commitment, extraordinary moral commitment at all. 
I discovered that, you know, in talk, having conversations with people, I discovered that many people think that moral lives are somehow boring and insipid. There's this cliche that evil people are fascinating and complex, whereas good people are simple and dull. Um, I was talking to a novelist I know at one point, and I asked, I asked him, why aren't there more novels about extraordinarily moral people? And he gave me this look of complete contempt, like I had asked him why he wouldn't write a novel about bunnies and little butterflies, which I felt was very irritating because he didn't understand it at all. On the other hand, something like half the people I, I spoke to about this book, um, you know, friends, people I met, said, oh, those very moral people, aren't they all mentally ill? And I thought, no, but how interesting that you would say that. Uh, I discovered that there's a sort of widespread thought that, that people who are extraordinarily selfless must be somehow twisted and weird. And I became fascinated by this hostility and skepticism about ambitious, ambitiously moral people. And I ended up sketching a history of this skepticism um, in at least Western culture. And here's a very, very, I mean, even rougher than the sketch that's in my book. I'll just give you a couple of uh, points. Uh, it seems to me that in the past hundred years in the West, there's two stages. First, it came to seem that helping people was much more difficult and liable to backfire than had previously been thought. And then the motives for helping people came to seem much more complicated and suspect than they had seemed before. And the result of these two, uh, these two cultural uh, uh, thoughts was that living an ethical life came over the past couple of hundred years to seem a lot less appealing and less straightforward than it once did. So again, just to give you a couple of points, for instance, in The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith, Adam Smith argued that a man pursuing his own selfish ends in combination with many others doing the same thing could end up working as effectively for the common good as if he had been doing so on purpose, maybe even more so. And this implanted deep in Western culture, the idea that individual selfishness could be beneficial for society as a whole. And that in turn suggested that if the moral goal was helping others, as opposed to perfecting one's own soul, a selfish man might do better than a selfless one. A century later, Darwin's or origin of the species introduced the idea that the self-interested the self struggle for survival was at the basis of life itself. Now, Darwin himself did not believe that selfishness was at the core of human nature. He believed that self-sacrificing behavior was a basic part of human nature that had come about through natural selection because survival, human survival was better ensured by a group of people who would cooperate and sacrifice for one another than by a, a group of selfish individuals. Um, groups that, pros that cooperated would prosper more than selfish groups. But for nearly a century after the origin of the species, um, this Darwinian rationale seemed unconvincing and contrived. And biologists, here comes the biologists, explained altruistic behavior with theories such as kin selection or reciprocal altruism. Um, altruism at the biological level, in other words, was just really selfishness in disguise. So the idea that selfishness might produce better results than selflessness arose first. And it was followed in the 20th century by the idea that trying to help other people might be not only ineffective, but something even more insidious, something twisted, something aggressive, and something even perverse. To Freud, an excess of virtue suggested what he called moral masochism. And this view set the tone in psychoanalysis and psychology for decades. Anna Freud, his daughter, was even more suspicious than her father had been. She coined the term altruistic surrender to describe the perverse mental state of a person unable to gratify his wishes except through a proxy. In the 1950s, Al-Anon, is, this is a group that was founded by the, uh, you, I, I assume you've heard of Alcoholics Anonymous, AA, uh, founded by alcoholics as a self-help group. Al-Anon was founded a couple of decades later, initially by the spouses of alcoholics to spread the idea that what had once looked like a virtue spouses of alcoholics trying to help their spouses to stop drinking, to cure them of alcoholism, was actually a symptom of the same disease. The helping was as bad as the drinking. This was the Al-Anon founding insight. 
And this concept spread very widely, especially in America, from its origin in Al-Anon to encompass all kinds of behavior. Um, by the 1970s, a term had been coined codependency, which described anyone who is preoccupied with changing other people's behavior. And the analysis was that this kind of helping uh, was just an aggressive form of control, an attempt to control someone in the guise of helping them. And in a way that was neither virtuous nor genuinely helpful. The combination of this is, a, you know, as, a, as you sort of very, very incredibly sketchy intellectual history of the idea of the suspicion of altruism. But the interesting, which is very, very prevalent in, in, in the West, at least, but the, the amb this ambivalent, the interesting thing about it is that I found that it is not a constant. Um, it varies greatly in times and, and different times, places, circumstances, and it can also change very quickly. And I wanna read another um, quick paragraph to give an example of, of times when it can change. I'm using the term do-gooder to describe altruistic people because to, to characterize this kind of skepticism, this pejorative term do-gooder is used to describe a skepticism towards altruistic people. There is one circumstance in which the extremity of do-gooders looks normal, and that is war. In wartime or in a crisis so devastating that it resembles war, such as an earthquake or a hurricane, duty extends far beyond its peacetime boundaries. In wartime, it's thought dutiful rather than unnatural to leave your family for the sake of a cause. In wartime, the line between family and strangers goes, grows faint as the duty to one's own enlarges to encompass all the people who are on the same side. It's usually assumed that the reason do-gooders are so rare is that it's human nature to care only for your own. And there's some truth to this, of course. But it's also true that many people care only for their own because they believe it's human nature to do so. When expectations change, as they do in wartime, behavior changes too. In war, what in ordinary times would be thought weirdly zealous becomes expected. In ordinary times, to ask a person to sacrifice his life for a stranger seems outrageous. But in war, it's commonplace. Acts that seem appallingly bad or appallingly good in normal circumstances become part of daily life. In wartime, extreme malevolence is excused and extreme virtue is also excused. People respond to this new moral regime in different ways. Some suffer under the tension of moral extremity and long for the forgiving looseness of ordinary life. Others feel that it was the time when they were most vividly alive in comparison with which the rest of life seems dull and lacking purpose. In peacetime, selflessness can seem soft, a matter of too, too much empathy and too little self-respect. In war, selflessness looks like valor. In peacetime, a person who ignores all obligations, who isn't civilized, who does exactly as he pleases, an artist who abandons duty for his art, even a criminal, can seem glamorous because he's amoral and free. But in wartime, duty takes on the glamour of freedom because duty becomes more exciting than ordinary liberty and because war permits freedoms unheard of in peacetime, like the freedom to kill. This is the difference between do-gooders and ordinary people. For do-gooders, it is always wartime. They always feel themselves responsible for strangers. They always feel that strangers like compatriots in war are their own people. They know that there are always those as urgently in need as the victims of battle, and they consider themselves conscripted by duty. This is pointing towards a conflict that I mentioned at the beginning, the conflict between caring for your own and caring for strangers. And with the story I told you about Aaron and Jen, um, the stakes were relatively low, um, but for others, they were much higher. And I just wanna read you um, another passage. This is about a man, Baba Amte, that uh, many of you will have heard of, but Venkat assured me, I was like, should I really uh, talk about this man who is so well known? But apparently, though his name is very well known, the details of his life may be less well known at this point. So I'm going to take the liberty of reading a little bit about my chapter of this man, this extraordinary man, and, and how he illuminates this particular question of, of family versus strangers. This is the story of a man who founded a leprosy colony in the wilderness in the center of India and who passed on this flourishing and celebrated enterprise to his children and their children as another man might a shipping business or a newspaper. 
The man had two sons. The younger started a clinic in a remote jungle and won fame and prizes like his father. The elder built on his father's work, but his achievements were not as recognized. The story began with a chance encounter one night in the rain that caused the man to change the course of his life and everything that happened for the generations that followed was due to that decision. But things could so easily have been different. One can imagine this man in a different time and place pursuing any number of ambitions with equal passion and tenacity. He might've been Henry Ford, he might've been Napoleon. If there are such things as congenital saints, he was not one of them. Here is what he started with. He was chronically restless he craved novelty and delighted in obstruction. He despised comfort. He needed life to be difficult. He needed to be thrown about and battered. He needed to be agitated. He needed to be in danger. He could tolerate a lot of pain and he was fearless and he valued those qualities in himself more than any others. One rainy night, the man passed a body lying by the side of the road. It was scarcely human. It was a leprosy patient in the last stages of the disease naked, barely alive, his hands and feet stumps, his nose caved in, his flesh decayed and crawling with maggots. The man was repelled by this ghastly sight and terrified that he might catch the disease, he ran. But then he realized that he had run in fear, he who was not afraid of anything. The thought of himself as fearful was more dreadful to him than the thought of catching leprosy. So he went back to the, to, the, to the man and covered him with a piece of cloth to shield him from the rain. The person was past help and soon died. But for weeks afterwards, this man was profoundly shaken by this experience. He had been scared, he had run away. He could not tolerate this thought, but it wouldn't leave him alone. He decided that the only thing that would restore his serenity was to steer directly into his fear until he was rid of it. He would make leprosy his life's work. He began with the idea of treating the disease, but later, after he had lived in his colony for many years, he realized that it was not just the alleviation of suffering that excited him, but the suffering itself. He believed that a person who had not felt pain, mental or physical, was incapable of strong attachments, and that shared suffering was the mortar of community. Pain broke a man open and let other people in. Suffering was at the core of what it meant to be human. His colony was held together by the suffering of the leprosy patients, Baba believed, and because he too had been in pain for much of his adult life. He had severely degenerative arthritis and was forced to spend time in traction and months in bed. He felt himself part of that fellowship. He wrote in a poem, to me, the kinship of pain has always been the strongest bond. I'm skipping over. He, he had trained as a young man, as a, as a lawyer, um, but once he had this, uh, made this decision to make leprosy his life's work, he realized that um, there was limits to what he could do as a lawyer. So he decided to spend a year studying at the Calcutta School of Tropical Medicine. A professor there told him that there was no cure for the disease, in part because it appeared impossible to transmit it to animals for the purpose of experiments. Baba thought about this for several days, and then he offered himself as a human experimental subject. He was injected with the leprosy bacillus and waited for his fate to be decided. He did not catch the disease. From then on, he knew that he was immune as it was later discovered. It turns out the vast majority of humans are also immune and had nothing to fear. As it happened, a cure for leprosy was developed shortly thereafter in 1950, the drug Dapsone. After his training in Calcutta, Baba moved back to Aurora and started traveling around the area dispensing doses. He soon realized that even though the drug could cure most patients medically, it couldn't change their lives. A leprosy patient taking medicine was soon no longer contagious, but whatever awful damage the disease had already done marked him forever. And fear of the disease was so great and the signs of it so unmistakable that even cured leprosy patients were rejected by their families. What happens, and again, forgive me if you know this, is that um, uh, Baba Amte applies to Madhya Pradesh for, for land and is given 50 acres of wilderness by the state. And at the time when he went to go live there with his wife and their two sons, who were then I think one and two years old, tiny, six leprosy patients, a cow and four dogs to, prevent, to protect them from wild animals. They're in the middle of nowhere. They build very crude huts at first to, to shelter them. And 
In the first few years, wild animals, panthers or tigers, um, broke into these huts and ate every single one of the dogs that they brought to protect them. And now, I don't know if anyone has visited um, Anand One as it now is, it's a flourishing community. Um, it's not just a refuge for people with leprosy, but uh, many other uh, syndromes. There's a, a man-made lake, there's schools, training, training colleges, a college, workshops, a cafe. Uh, people get married there, have children there, live there for their whole lives. It's an extraordinary place. But this is what I mean by the extraordinary sacrifices that some uh, people I met are prepared to make. So the panthers that ate all four dogs did not capture um, the sons, but they might have done. And the sons did not catch leprosy, but they might have done. As I said, at that, at that time, people didn't realize that leprosy is actually quite hard to catch. And that was the risk that he took for the sake of building this community. So these are very difficult choices to make. And was he right to endanger his sons for the sake of the leprosy patients? Did he draw the line between family and community and strangers in the right place? This conflict, this, these kinds of decisions between family and strangers were for everyone I spoke to the deepest conflict in their moral lives. And I myself deeply admired the way they grappled with this question. But I came to realize that for many other people, any calculation of this sort, any weighing of the interests of family and strangers is intolerable. Many people I, I've met believe that there should be no sacrifice too great for a person you love and that anyone who would contemplate sacrificing the interests of the people they love is somehow strange and unnatural. The philosopher um, uh, Bernard Williams, the late Bernard Williams, had a, uh, wrote about this he, using the thought experiment that Aaron and Jen discussed. He said, imagine a man standing on a beach and there, his wife is drowning over here and two strangers are drowning over there. Is it permissible for him to save his wife? And he said, this man standing there on the beach wondering if it's permissible is having one thought too many. And when he rescues his wife, he probably should not tell her about his difficult moral conundrum. And when Bernard Williams puts it like that, it seems obviously right that the man should save his life, um, uh, save his wife, excuse me. But actually it's not so obvious because maybe your wife versus two strangers or your mother or your child versus two strangers might seem uh, like a relatively easy call, perhaps. But what about a hundred strangers or a thousand or a million? At a certain point, the question is going to seem much harder. And this is not just a hypothetical, um, this is not just a hypothetical question. What I'm describing is a situation that actually arises during wartime. And in wartime, as we've seen, moral questions tend to look very different. And I came to realize that I was thinking about how those kinds of questions seem so different in wartime than they do uh, when, when countries are not at war. And I think I came to believe that at least in America, uh, one of the reasons there is such skepticism about the ambitiously moral people is that it has been a very long time here since there has been conscription for a war that was considered just. So there was conscription in the Vietnam War, but many people thought that was not a just war. So it's really been since World War II um, when there was a, a time in this country, in America, in which the sacrifice of a brother, a son, a husband for a larger cause was expected of everybody and seemed quite normal. There's almost nobody left alive in this country, in America, who has had that experience. And so it may be that in the absence of that older form of duty, our sense to, of duty to family has expanded to take its place. So that now sacrificing family for a cause can seem to many people unnatural and extreme. And I think it's this sense that it's unnatural and extreme to sacrifice family for a cause in order to help strangers is a deeper reason why many of us don't give more than we do. It's not just selfishness, though of course that's a part of it, but I believe that there's also a genuine moral conflict about what is most important in life and what is the best way to live. Okay, I'm gonna stop there and uh, hand back to uh, Samanth and I hope we can continue the conversation, all of us. 
Thank you. That was so great, Larissa. Thank you so much for that introduction to the book. It's a book everybody, I think, who's listening here today should definitely go out and read because it contains so much more than this half an hour talk that Larissa gave. So many more <laughs> stories and you know case studies, as you might call them. I wanted to know, I mean, when I was reading this, I was curious first to ask you, when I say what brought you to this subject, what I meant, uh, what I mean to ask is, what stage of your own life were you at that you were thinking about extreme idealism, extreme altruism? What were you seeing in the world around you that maybe thought um, that radical kindness might be a theme that you wanted to explore? Was there a lack of radical kindness in the world at large in sort of the earlier years of this decade? I think, no, I mean, I, this is something I've always been interested in. So I don't think it was so much a response to the particular histor historical moment, though, as I uh, hinted at in this talk, I do think that there is enormous variation historically in different times and places in terms of how people think about um, altruism and how skeptical or embracing they are of of altruism as a way of life. I mean, one thing that that uh, I think I didn't mention in in that summary, but um, but I think it has affected a lot of people in terms of how they think about ambitiously moral lives is the growing understanding of the extreme problems, both political and economic and practical with uh, foreign aid. You know, a sort of cliched uh, uh, thing for idealistic young people to do in America was to uh, join the Peace Corps or to become a foreign aid worker. And in the past, certainly 10 years, but uh, much longer than that, has become apparent both how colonialist and uh, unhelpful and twisted politically um, the motives of such workers can be, and also that that uh, the even on a pragmatic economic level, uh, foreign aid can often do more harm than good. That it's um, an extremely complicated and messy business, and and you know that that foreign aid is 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 the most uh, extreme example. But same the sim a similar skeptical skeptical lens has been applied to. Uh, all kinds of varieties of domestic social work as well. Um, by domestic, I mean within our country. Um, you know, the 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 motives of people uh, that that sort of idea, which I um, talked about very briefly in terms of Al-Anon, um, but has spread very widely. The idea that people try to help others as much out of a desire to control them and tell them what is right to do as a desire to genuinely help has become very widespread. And so that was part of the reason I became interested in, um, in that skepticism and in this particular moment. But I think, you know, it's, it's, it just really changes very, very dramatically. I think often countries in a, a sort of post-independence moment have a, a few years of extreme idealism um, where the idea of dedicating your life to your country or to a particular set of people within your country becomes very attractive to a lot of, you know, bright young people. And then often that idealism, that idealistic moment fades. So it's, I don't think there was anything particular about the early 2010s. Um, I think it's, if you, if you uh, look historically at the movements of, of different cultures, you will see that in pre pretty much everywhere, the, the attraction to idealism or the skepticism about idealism comes and goes depending on many factors. Yeah, because you say quite early in the book at one point that a passion for morality used to not quite be so strange and it is now. And I think, and, and that sort of brought to mind this other thematic absence in your book, really, because while there are people in your book who engage with religion as practitioners, you know, people who are religious or indeed people who are even affiliated with the church, it doesn't seem very often as if these altruistic impulses come out of what religion mandates, right? I mean, it's not as if they're all of them are uniformly harking to the words of their preacher or their good book uh, to go out and do these things. Uh, very often, it seems to be something that is much more abstract and much less verbalized by whatever faith they happen to be in. I mean, the people in my book are about 50-50 religious and not religious. And I think, you know, idealism and altruism flourish in both situations. But the people who are religious very much are driven by, uh, well, they're driven to, broadly speaking, engage in an altruistic life by their religion, but the religion does not prescribe 
um, the specifics of their life, nor could it because, you know, I mean, the, the, for instance, the woman who gave uh, one of her kidneys to this, to a stranger, you know, no religion requires that of people. And I mean, she, I asked her, I asked several people, um, what difference do you think religion makes? What is the difference between an altruist who uh, is religious and one who isn't? And um, this woman who was a uh, pastor in the United Methodist Church gave me a really interesting answer. She said, you know, I think the difference is that if you are a person of faith, you, you, you believe that you are obligated to work hard for other people and do your best. But in the end, um, whether the world gets better or not is God's business. It's not, it's not up to you. You have to still work as hard as you can, but you're not ultimately going to make that difference. And you're not alone. Whereas she said, you know, the people who do not believe in God believe that we really are alone here and no one, no one else is going to help. No one else is going to do anything. There is no big plan that, that makes it okay that there is uh, suffering. And so while the one sort of person may not work harder or more passionately than the other, there is a kind of, there is a kind of aloneness uh, to, to atheism that doesn't exist for people of faith who believe that it's what happens is not ultimately up to them. And, and in conjunction with that, did you then sort of, I mean, the fact that these people had devoted their lives to such extreme idealism, did you get the sense again and again that there was always going to be a sense of frustration or a sense of dissatisfaction in their lives because they couldn't carry out as much of their altruistic impulses as they wanted to, that there was always going to be somebody left out or somebody always falling through the cracks, um, no sort of significant diminishment in poverty or suffering or or disease or anything of the sort, did it always feel at, in some measure unfulfilled? Yes. You know, I came to, it, even though the people I was writing about were, were by or ordinary standards very extreme in their commitment, I came to realize that, and it's not really surprising, that in order to, to maintain your commitment for the long haul, for the whole of your life, you have to draw limits, otherwise you'll lose your mind. So um, in many of these lives, they, these people in their uh, late teens, early twenties went through a period where they were profoundly depressed, profoundly anxious, just because the, the weight of the world was so extreme. And I mean, that actually something else that I, I want to mention is, is, you know, something else that surprised me about these people is that I think that an important element of being a, an extraordinarily altruistic person is actually aesthetic, is a, a quality of imagination, because many of us, um, many of us, and you don't usually think of those two things together, but, you know, many of us don't really think about what's going on in the world until it's right in front of us. So uh, at the time I was writing this book, um, and you may remember this, or maybe, no, it was, maybe it was after it had been, anyway, there was, remember when there was the worst of the refugee uh, crisis of people coming over to Greece from, um, from Northern Africa. And there was that photograph of, of the toddler drowning in, this, in the sea. And for many people, it was not until they saw the photograph of that little kid drowned um, in the sea that they felt the, the depth of the, of the crisis. They knew about it before, but they didn't feel it. And the people I'm writing about don't need a photograph. They don't need somebody to, to be wounded in front of them. They, can, they have a sufficiently vivid imagination that they feel it um, without the visual evidence that the rest of us um, sometimes need to really take it on as an emotional fact. Anyhow, so they, they go through this period of life where the, everything is just overwhelming and they can see suffering everywhere. They not see, I mean, that's the opposite of what they do. They, they know that it's there and it feels like an emotional fact to them. Just the knowledge that for many people is just an intellectual uh, knowledge. And then they learn to close parts of it off. Now, most of us close it off too much and don't think about it at all much of the time but they learn to close off. They learn to, to narrow their moral focus to a particular group of people or a particular cause that they can focus on and 
so so Aaron Pitkin, for instance, the, the man I, I read about first, um, at first he was all over the place. He was appalled by all forms of suffering. He was he was throwing himself around. He was working in six different nonprofits at once, not sleeping, not doing anything else. And he was he was going to lose his mind. He was going to have a nervous breakdown. And then he 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 was like, OK, I'm going to confine myself to this this kind of suffering that I and he had learned he was particularly good as an advocate for this particular cause. And he saw also that it was not much subscribed to, that it was, um, you know, no one else cared about, about chickens. Um, and so this was something that he would, uh, you know, his value added. And he learned to close off his mind to some of the suffering that was was left over. And I think that's necessary, but but everyone was was tormented by that at first. And the, the process of, of maintaining commitment was, a, was about this very, very tricky uh, sort of self-manipulation where you train yourself not to not care about other forms of suffering, but not to be so affected by them that they make you unable to function because they are so overwhelming. Um, there's a question from a YouTube user that um, overlaps quite neatly with something that I'd wanted to ask as well. Uh, the question from a user is, do you think there is an overlap between individual idealism and the local political climate? And this was something that I was thinking about, morality as seen under different sorts of, I guess, political economic regimes. Um, you read out Adam Smith just now, and obviously under sort of the capitalist structure, in a capitalist structure, you would think that the individual is paramount primarily in his or her participation in the market as a, as a singular person. In socialism, you have a different kind of structure when you think about the individual's relationship with society, um, which might, under the right interpretation, yield something that is much more um, all-encompassing. You don't really think about it, the individual on the market. You think about what you might call the public good. And so did you get a sense of how altruistic people or do-gooders were perceived outside of the capitalist set of the US or the West. I mean, I ask this because it's interesting to consider if it's a cultured human response to think about do-gooders as weird zealots, or, or whether it's a more sort of universal human response, um, whether they stand out in any kind of society that they emerge in. I don't think it's universal. I think it really, really varies. I mean, first of all, um, you know, I, I would push back a little bit on the idea that under capitalism, people are more selfish than they are under socialism, because while that, that does seem logical, and maybe to some extent that's true, it's interesting because one thing that has struck me is looking at comparing, if you compare, now, Europe is by no means socialist, uh, don't get me wrong, but it is slight, you know, there's, there's a slightly larger sense of the state in Europe than there is in the US. And one thing that's always been very striking to me is that the, um, the, the rate of charitable giving is much higher in the US than it, than it is in Europe. And I don't think that's because Americans are more generous or more warm hearted than Europeans. My interpretation is that it's a political fact that in Europe, there are higher expectations of the state, that there are certain things that are properly the, the job of the state to take care of and that it should take care of. And, and whereas in the US, so many people feel that the state uh, should not be taking care of anything except for the bare minimum, that people are moved to feel, well, okay, I as an individual, uh, as a charitable individual ought to be taking up the slack. So, you know, it's not necessarily the case that a more generous political situation leads to individual um, generosity. But I mean, in terms of, of, is it true that in all times and places, uh, this type of extreme altruism has be been considered peculiar? Maybe in its most extreme forms, but I do think there's enormous difference. I mean, one example that really struck me when I was, when I was reading about um, and interviewing people about Baba Amte, one person who he who he interacted with uh, to some extent does was and forgive me if I pronounce this incorrectly Vinoba Bave, who was as you I'm sure know a Sanskrit scholar and an associate of Gandhi's of a younger generation, and in the immediate post independence um, moment, which again in many many countries maybe all countries is a moment of unusually unusual public idealism, um, he launched this campaign where he went and walked around um, 
uh, I don't know how, how far, I don't know how many miles, but uh, large areas of the country asking large landowners to donate um, some of their land to the poor. And, you know, but he didn't solve uh, the land problem, but he, it was, it was amazingly successful. And I think that is something that would not have been possible at another moment. Um, there are only some moments when a person like that is taken seriously, who says, you know, you need to give up some of your land to the poor and people will not think he's a crazy person. Um, they might actually do it because of the prestige of idealism at that particular political moment. Um, you know, if such a person appeared now, he would probably be laughed at if, it's, you know, either in America or in India or in any, any number of other places. I think that there are brief moments when just, and, and wartime is one such moment or post-independence in or, uh, or post-revolution in, in, in any number of countries is a moment where temporarily that kind of ask, give up some of your wealth to the poor sounds totally reasonable and sounds inspiring and sounds like something you would want to be part of. And then at other times it's like, no, and seems completely ridiculous. But, but just to be clear, I mean, your book, you know, it talks about something that is, in a sense, um, quite the polar opposite from the kind of philanthropic or charitable giving that we talk about when we talk about Mackenzie Scott giving out $2.8 billion, oh. you know, because it is obviously a smaller portion of her net worth. It um, takes her sort of very little time to decide what to do with it and where to go with it. And then the rest of her life continues in exactly the same way. And the argument can be made that a lot of American charitable or charitable giving anywhere is the kind that enables you to then live your life with sort of a relatively guilt-free conscience, but exactly as you were otherwise living. Whereas the people that you talk about have indeed given up a much greater proportion of their lives and existences in the pursuit of this idealism and this altruism. Oh, yes. I mean, when I compare charitable giving in, in the US and Europe, I'm talking about ordinary charitable giving, right. um, which is, as you say, completely different, a completely different order of things from, from the people I'm talking about. The people I'm talking about are extremely rare. Right. They're very unusual. Um, but, but when you, you introduce the idea of how is the perception of idealism affected by the political system, I just, you know, I wanted to talk about people as a whole. Um, and I think you know, the measure of charitable giving, it's, yes, you're right, it's very small and it's, it's uh, insignificant in the economies of most individuals who are giving to charity. It just, just makes them feel a little better. Though it's interesting because, I mean, another thing I discovered that I didn't expect when I've, I've been talking about this book, um, many people have said, well, you know, a lot of people just give to charity because it makes them feel warm and fuzzy and doesn't that negate the virtue of the gift? And I thought, you know, imagine a person who gave stuff away and didn't feel good about it, who just felt completely cold. Like, would that be better? Like, why? I don't know. I mean, I, I can see what they mean, that you're sort of purchasing a warm and fuzzy feeling about yourself. And undoubtedly, that's the reason that many people give to charity. But does it invalidate it? Does it make it uh, not good? I don't think so. Um, right. You know, you don't really right. want to cultivate a, a, a type of human being that would be left completely cold and uh, by, by the thought of giving to others. Um, there's another question here from uh, somebody who's listening uh, about whether this kind of discussion of morality, of individualistic morality, distracts from questions of systemic or ideological issues. And this is something we often, you know, find ourselves running into as consumers today in particular, right? I mean, why you and I might be thinking about whether to buy a, a, an electric car or a small, you know, petrol car, and we are thinking about our personal carbon footprint and things like that. The concept of the carbon footprint itself was invented and propagated by a big petroleum company to, to kind of distract us from the larger systemic uh, problems in corporate uh, corporations and governments. And so this question of what we ourselves can do um, for the world, whether it is from an environmental sense or any other sense, um, in a sense, is we are we are now learning is itself a weak and um, irrelevant one that we should really be pressing for sort of much more system systemic change. And so I wondered about the tensions in your book between that about the fact that these are clearly individuals who are 
holding on to a particular belief that one person can do a lot of good versus the larger world in which they operate, which seems to run along these systems that are deeply flawed and themselves need much more profound change. Look, I think that's completely true. You know, that, that, that it's definitely the case that uh, any one individual trying to help two or three other individuals is, is a drop in the bucket and that, that any real change has to come at the level of government. And that's absolutely the case. And there is a real danger, and this is another add to our list of reasons that people are skeptical of, of the kind of altruists I'm writing about, that you're right, that, that uh, a focus on such individual action and individual heroism can uh, cloud over the real structural issues that are at the heart of, of the problem. Um, that's definitely true. But first of all, so, so some people I wrote about, like Aaron, for instance, um, does work at the level of structures. Like he... Um, he lobbies, or he and his organization have been very successful at changing laws and lobbying. I mean, in the U.S., um, the, often the best way to change things is not through laws, but through giant companies. So, for instance, you know, they will lobby McDonald's to change their uh, to change uh, their practices, what kinds of eggs they buy, or what kinds of uh, meat they buy. And if McDonald's changes, that's such a giant fact in the overall market that often um, uh, farmers and producers will have to change their practices practices because it, it makes sense for them to do so. Or similarly, uh, he worked on a, um, a law in California to change uh, state law in California about what kinds of uh, practices were acceptable in farming. And California, again, is so enormous that when California changed, the whole market had to change. So he does work at the level of structure. But I think the answer to that question is that there's there's need for both. I mean, you know, should everyone who's doing any kind of altruistic work drop it and become um, a, a lobbyist of government? No, because there are some things that uh, have to be done at the level of structural change and political political change, but other things not. So um, a couple I mentioned at the very beginning who I wrote about who adopted 20 special needs children. You know, there are many things that governments do better than individuals, but raising children is not one of them. And so if you have a problem where you have children who would either spend their lives in an institution or be adopted into a family, that is work at the individual level that, um, that there's no other way to do. Yeah, because I think like thinking about these things too much can be sometimes paralytic in its own, in its own way. Um, a friend of mine who works for an NGO in Bangalore told me about, she heard about this talk and she is going to read your book, but she told me about the, the feelings she sometimes has when she considers where the money is coming from to support the work that she does, the kinds of people who are you know, donating this money, it may not always be money that is um, obtained in the cleanest of ways. And, and, and this problem also of being in this space and going out to work and worrying that you're preaching or that you are you know, sort of pushing a particular worldview or a particular way of doing things upon people who may not have the agency to reject it if they want to. Um, and so, you know, this, this, this conflict and this tension that is inherent in her work suggests that we're all, I mean, even Aaron, Aaron Pitkin or Charles Gray or any of the other people you wrote about are operating in such an imperfect world that you have to sort of make your own little pocket of it as perfect as possible and hope that the rest of it changes alongside. It's really difficult. I mean, you know, you know, if you get deep enough into these political uh, difficulties, uh, the temptation is to say there's nothing I can do that will not make things in some way worse. And it's impossible to calculate whether I'm making things better or worse in, in the aggregate. And so I should just stay home and watch TV. And that's, you know, maybe a plausible position. And especially in, in, um, in America, I mean, there's a recent book called Winners Take All by a friend of mine, Anand Girdardas, which makes the argument that you know, charity has has been extremely pernicious in the way that it has uh, acculturated people to think of, of billionaires as benevolent and uh, to uh, very, very clearly offset um, greater uh, levels of taxation of those billionaires because they, uh, you know, and of course, that's one of the reasons they do these charitable works is, is so people can see, oh, my gosh, look at Bill Gates. He's doing so much good in the world. We better not tax him um, because that then then he would stop doing all that good work. Um, so that's that's one problem. Another problem is, uh, again, with well, let's uh, pick on the Gates Foundation, um, you know, they are un, unelected. And so there's an enormous amount of power that comes with charitable work. So uh, something that one thing that the Gates Foundation did a few years ago was 
they decided that the big schools were one of the problems with the U.S. educational system. Um, and so they, uh, with their enormous funds, incentivized um, schools to break up into smaller schools. And, you know, this massive intervention into the public educational system. A few years later, it seemed like actually that wasn't the problem and the smaller schools didn't do any better. And, you know, oh, well, let's try something else. You know, this was all done with foundation billionaire money. There was no public input. I mean, the schools, the individual schools had to agree. It's not like they were forced, but with a certain amount of money, it's like hmm, semi-forced. Um, and so there are profound problems with uh, valuing um, uh, charity over over politics. Um, and it really can do more harm than good. I mean, it's one thing that's very striking. Uh, another friend of mine wrote a book of, about this, this problem, um, Rob Reich, who's a professor at Stanford, a political science professor at Stanford. And he had a historical section at the beginning of his book pointing out that at the uh, beginning of the 20th century, before there was a charitable uh, tax deduction or foundations and foundations didn't yet exist, there was, uh, I think it was, was it Carnegie? No, it was not Carnegie. It was, was it Ford? One of the in early 20th century billionaires goes to Congress to get a permission to have a charitable foundation. And today everyone would say, how great, how wonderful, what a generous man. The Congress at that time, which I think was like around 1910, <clears throat> said, no way. Why would we do that? Why would we allow you, unelected uh, random rich person, to to start doing huge structural things to our country just because you think they're a good idea. No way. And he was completely rejected. And there was a profound, you know, post Gilded Age suspicion of rich people trying to do uh, things that looked looked good to to the public. So, you know, there's definitely um, it's it's it, the, de the problem is definitely much larger than, oh, billionaires are just doing this to make themselves feel good. It's much worse than that. Right. Um, I have a few questions here from the audience, so I'm just going to run through them. Bhavya asks, how did the bene beneficiaries of the people you profiled perceive the altruism? Did it prompt obligation or dependence? Were there longer relationships that were cultivated out of these altruistic acts? That's a great question. Um, I mean, in Aaron Pitkin's case, chickens, we do not know what they think. <laughs> um, the, so the jury is out there. In terms of the, um, I mean, one one situation I always wonder about is uh, the couple I mentioned. I keep mentioning who adopted twenty special needs kids. I mean, you know, one of the reasons that what they did was so hard is that charitable impulse is not enough. You know, if you adopt adopt twenty kids because you want to do them good out of charity, then you failed. You have to do it for yourself in part, because you love them, because you want to. Um, otherwise you're not a parent, you're a social worker. And um, the complication of, but you know, the, the, the sort of tangle of pity and love, it's very complicated. So I feel like what they did was in a way the hardest test of, of what you're describing, that difficulty of how do you try to help someone while not condescending to them, not trying to control them. You know, it's very, very complicated. And, it, you know, every situation is, is different. I mean, uh, Baba Amte had this very uh, firm conviction that charity was, was t a terrible thing to impose upon a, a human. I mean, he, his, um, Anand One was founded um, in a uh, in a rejection, in a spirit of rejection of the um, leprosy colonies that were run by Christian missionaries at the time, uh, where the reigning idea was these poor people, they can't do anything. We just need to take care of them and convert them to Christianity and, and they can lie in bed and just be sick. And his idea was, you know, a man can live without fingers, but not without self-respect. No, you know, if you have three fingers, you can still do a lot of things with three fingers. And, um, and so he thought that kind of charitable relationship was death. And, you know, I think there's been a lot of thinking on precisely this question because, um, because of this, you know, I think this is the positive side of the skepticism towards altruistic impulses that I was describing. I mean, the negative side is obvious that, that, uh, that many people use it to dismiss altruism and say, oh, it's just, you know, mental illness or it's, or it's people just doing it to make themselves feel better. I'm just going to watch TV. 
But the positive side is that there has been a lot of, you know, over the past, I don't know, 50, 75 years, a lot of very thoughtful writing and thinking um, about how to help someone without making them feel demeaned, without making them feel, uh, without, without, you know, to try to sort of examine your own motives, to try to purge yourself in a way that's maybe impossible of tangled power dynamics. Um, you know, it's, it's impossible to get rid of those power dynamics um, unless you get rid of the power structure altogether, which is, you know, a distant goal. But, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of some other examples. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's really difficult because, you know, in a lot of cases, um, people want to reject the help that they uh, are offered. And that may be a very, very good impulse. So all I can say is, you know, it just depends on the situation. And I think that this is, yeah, that this is the good side of that skepticism that I think, uh, especially people like social workers, teachers, people who are in a face-to-face -face relationship with the people they're trying to help are a lot more aware of the complexity of their situation and aware that uh, coming in as Lady Bountiful is going to do more harm than good. Um, Marisha, who's in the audience as well, asks, financial ambition is normalized and even encouraged, sometimes at the cost of much else. How come moral ambition has not or is not an aspirational thing? You know, we've had centuries perhaps of um, religions talking about the importance of idealism and moral goodness. Um, how come that doesn't become aspirational the way financial ambition does? I mean, as I said, I think sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. You know, I mean, cultures go through historical shifts and at some times idealism seems exciting. You know, I mean, I don't know any culture as well as the US where I've been living for my whole adult life. And, you know, here it often varies with the election cycle. You know, some, some political leader will come along like, you know, at the beginning when Obama was running for president and it seemed to a lot of people like, wow, things might actually change. Idealism became very attractive to a lot of uh, for younger people. And then, uh, you know, cynicism set in and, and it seemed less attractive. And, you know, at certain times it seems that things can really change and, and other times it seems that nothing will ever change. And, um, and so it's historic. I mean, I think that to me is hopeful that whatever you see where you are at the time you're living is not set in stone. It's not like, you know, humans are always equally selfish and they're always out for themselves and that never changes. That's just human nature. That I do not believe. I do not believe in human nature. I believe in history and I believe in culture. And I think these things can change and often very, very suddenly, um, you know, again, if you read about how people behave, uh, during wartime, during a time when, it, 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 as long as it's a war that seems just to people, I mean, if it's a terrible war, that's different. But like, if people feel that there is a joint enterprise that is worth fighting for and worth sacrificing for, sacrifice becomes uh, attractive to people very quickly. It can change very quickly, um, which is which is the encouraging part. Um, and but I would also point out that that in terms of 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 altruism and what has seemed attractive to people, I think um, the content of that also varies uh, historically. So, and, and it varies, I mean, we were talking about religions earlier. I think, you know, it varies also in terms of uh, religion. So it's, and, and again, excuse that this is very, very broad generalization, but some religions such as Buddhism, I believe Hinduism, Christianity, valorize there is a, there's a space for the ascetic the person who uh, leaves ordinary life behind and pursues a spiritual life even if that means leaving behind a family whereas again broadly speaking uh, according to certain traditions within Judaism and Islam there is much more skepticism about that path that your duty is first to your family and then you can take care of people outside your family, but you must make sure that your family um, is taken care of and leaving your family behind to pursue a purely spiritual life. Certainly in some traditions that is valorized, but it's, it's less a broad, broadly. So, you know, again, I please don't uh, think that I'm making generalizations about these enormous uh, world traditions, but all I'm meaning to say is that there are different strains of different traditions where uh, sometimes working for strangers at the expense of your family looks like the most 
altruistic thing to do. And in other strains of traditions, that does not look like an altruistic thing to do. That in fact, um, the thing to do is to take care of your family first and anyone who doesn't do that is a moral failure. And so, you know, the content is also important as well as the, as the quantity. Have you been seeing a lot of do-gooding during the pandemic? Does the pandemic strike you as a kind of uh, a war situation or a kind of revolution situation where there is a kind of impossible idealism? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, it's like, it's, yeah, it's a kind of a wartime situation, not as, I mean, the problem with the pandemic is that, of course, unlike in, in wartime, what we've all been told to do is, is stay at home and not see anybody else. And you can, you can engage in, in charitable acts from home, and many people have been doing that. You can give money, you can organize uh, food banks, you can, you can organize uh, neighborhood associations, help for your neighbors or for the broader, the broader uh community, but the pandemic is a very interesting situation morally, I think, because, you know, usually when you're in an emergency, like a natural disaster or a war, uh, what people do is come together. Uh, they, they meet, they, they come together in groups of, of, of people they've never met before because they are organizing for some common purpose related to this calamity that's facing the whole country or the whole region. And, um, and, and out of those comings together emerge a, a sense of fellowship that doesn't exist in ordinary times. But the pandemic, you know, maybe this is, this may be a unique moral situation in the sense that it's uh, on the one hand, a disaster uh, where, um, you know, extraordinary numbers of people are suffering and dying. On the other hand, you know, at least in, in the US, the messaging was the thing you can do is, is stay at home and not, not meet strangers, do the opposite, never spend any time with anyone but your family. And, and then we come back to our, uh, you know, the, the thing I was saying earlier about imagination, you know, it may be that for uh, people with an extraordinary uh, altruistic imagination, that doesn't matter. They know people are suffering and they are driven to help them even though they don't see them. But I think for most people, if you don't see people, if you aren't meeting the people, if you don't have this visual, reminder of the suffering, the mere information is not enough. Just the knowledge that people are suffering doesn't, isn't an emotional fact for many people. And so, you know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I'm sure many people are assembling data about how much people have done during the pandemic compared to, to normal and, and we'll see studies about this uh, later. But I think it's a very interesting moral situation to test how important is is that human fellowship that's, that's generated by the kind of coming together that is normal in disastrous times and is not normal now. Excellent. Um, we have so many questions we couldn't possibly get through all of them. Uh, thank you so much for giving me a chance to do this. Larissa, it's just been so uh, amazing to talk to you. I, I should say that I'm a huge fan of Samans and, and his work is so extraordinary. And I, I'm very, very honored that you would, uh, you would take time to, to do this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for staying on for the full conversation. If you like what we do, please share it with your friends and family. You can also leave us a review or rating on iTunes and Apple Podcasts. The crew that makes these podcasts possible is Gaurav Krishna on sound supervision and production with support from S. Saranaraj and Raghavendra Tenkaila. Artwork and design is by Chandni Venkataraman of Criss Cross Design Studio. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. Do follow us on Instagram for updates on all our programming. This is Lekha Naidu signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.